Thank you. Thank you. Thanks to everyone. It's a pleasure to be here. I want to start with the usual the ritual. Uh, thanks. I, I am glad. Uh, I was very happy to receive your invitation to this seminar, mostly because I, Davide was right, I consider myself a category theorist. So whenever I have to interact with more uh, skilled mathematicians, I am always in a little bit of a hole. Oh, so uh, you will see I'm not a logician. I have uh, some idiosyncratic ways of understanding the stuff I'm talking about. I hope you will not mind. And I hope I can show you something you, of course, already know, but seen in a different way, with a different eye. So the scope of this talk is to uh, tell you something about this paper that I have in, uh, in uh, uh, it's, it's a joint work with uh, other people. You see their names on the on the title slide. Uh, one is Pavel Sopochinsky, the head of the research group here in on applied category theory on compositional methods in computer science. Chad Nestor is one of his PhD students, and uh, even De Liberti is a real good friend, a colleague that now is in um, Czech Republic at the Czech Academy of Science in Prague. So we got together because we had this really deep will to understand factorial semantics um, in a re and relating it to a certain problem that uh, we felt was needed to fix, sort of fix that apparent gap in the literature of the of, on the subject. So. What you are about to, uh, to, to I, I told you this is a joint work with other people, many other people actually, quite unusual for a mathematics paper, especially a category theory paper. And if you hear other talks about uh, this subject, for example, if you ask Pavel, if you ask Ivan, if you ask Chad, um, you will hear a completely different story because uh, like they have a sort of different way to understand the, the problem, the motivations, they were motivated by other ideas than mine. I think this is a, a plus side on the work. And um, I guess I told you, I, I have a little bit of an of a idiosyncratic way to express the reasons why I am interested in this, in this topic, in this subject. So uh, yeah, uh, the topic of the paper is to offer uh, a variety theorem for um, partial algebraic theories, namely for those algebraic theories where operations can be partially defined. They have a um, possibly smaller than total domain of definition. Think, for example, to uh, composition in a category or the order relation in a partially ordered set which is not total. Or think, for example, to uh, composition of functions that have a do certain domain of definition, which is not, which is smaller than their usual domain of definition. So, as you certainly know very well, uh, Bill Lovier offered a very clean, a very neat, elegant categorical way to understand uh, uh, classical, totally defined uh, algebraic theories. The scope, the, the, the aim of this paper was to find uh, an analog for uh, partially defined theories that have a huge amount of applications in mathematics, in logic, in computer science, in many areas of the stuff we do and like in our everyday life. So now for the plan of the talk. I decided to divide the, the talk in two parts. And the first part will be mostly 100% introductory, although a little bit uh, mm, uh, different from the usual presentation that you see for, for algebraic theories and for Fantoria semantics. I wanted to try, at least try, to sketch a possible um, diachronic and synchronic uh, approach to this huge topic in category theory, in logic, in intersects many areas of mathematics. And the second part will be a uh, presentation of what we did. So I will uh, clearly 
state draw a line where the the interaction stops and uh, i think just for the for the sake of the of the of the health of the speaker i can stop at the first out for five ten minutes and then we can we can go on i didn't um i didn't uh, uh, check if i was exactly at the half of my talk at where the first half ends but uh, you can uh, you can tell me and uh, uh, of course, if you have questions, if you have any, if you see you don't understand something and you want to ask clarifications, please do. And I'm more than happy to stop and maybe even skip some information, provided I can explain better what I want to say. Okay, so let's start. Let's start with the, the classical picture and with two... Um, let's say slogans that maybe I would uh, that that maybe constitute the, the the gist of the of my presentation and the two ideas I want you to take home after today's talk the first one is a little bit of a of a, um, an excuse to 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 fight with you because I have this idea this debatable idea that if only you knew category theory, you could have invented universal algebra. At least the piece that uh, Lovier's Factorial Semantics uh, describes. Of course, I'm not, I don't want to encompass the whole uh, the whole uh, set of universal algebra, the whole the whole of logic. But uh, as a category theorist, I have this idea that uh, Lovier's approach makes things very easy, very streamlined, and uh, with just the definition, you can say a lot, you can understand a lot about uh, what's going on when you study sets with operations. Okay, of course, you have to restrict in various ways this, this, uh, this task, but you know, you know how it works. Okay, and the second is uh, this quote by Sammy Allenberg that you maybe known as the founder of category theory, one of the two founders of category theory. I like how this idea, the, the quote is, if you define it right, you won't need a subscript. I really like this idea because I agree, and I really like the way this completely strips any, any dignity away from uh, some pieces of, of logic that are, uh, that are uh, full of subscripts and superscripts and tuples and so on. So if you want to fight, don't fight me, fight other category theorists, and especially Sammy Allenberg. I, 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 I know he will be happy to, <laughs> if only he was still alive. Anyway, now enough with the chit-chatting, let's start with the mathematics. Uh, let's start with a very simple fact, this introductory part of the, of the talk. The, the category of finite sets and functions can be regarded as the free co-completion of the point under finite coproducts. This is just the category theorist way to say that every finite set is a finite coproduct of points, of singletons. But uh, in category theory, you know very well that uh, uh, you get every theorem, uh, you, you, you pay for one theorem and you get two. So, the opposite of the category of finite sets and functions is the free completion of the point under finite products. And there is literally nothing more to say than this, than the same universal property just stated in terms of the opposite universal construction. So again, this is some, something we all know since elementary school. Every finite number is a sum of ones repeated sufficient number of times. And uh, at some point, Lovier, Bill Lovier, proposed uh, this definition in order to encompass um, the, the theory, the uh, um, universal algebra, a piece of universal algebra. So we today call a Lovier theory a functor from the opposite of the category of finite sets and functions to another category that has the, the same object, so P is required to be the identity on objects, and uh, it's P, this functor P is also required to preserve products. So this property uh, is exactly what's needed for P to preserve products. I will leave these, if you have never seen this, but I doubt, these 
immediately entails that uh, uh, P is uniquely defined by its action on, on the point, on the, on the generator of fin, on one, so that every P of n is just an iterative power of P of ones. So what's the uh, um, if you want to fix a set and uh, operations, an array operations for every possible arity, you just have to fix a functor of this kind because P of one will be your set carrier and P of n will be uh, P of, yeah, P of n will be the either the nth power of P of one and every um, every every morphism that you might have in L will describe an n array operation on P of one. Easy. Of course, there is a category. Sorry, sorry but what you what you mean when you say identity an object? Because you might uh, want to analyze L, L as the same object as as, uh, as fin one two three four etc. And uh, uh, P acts as the identity at the level of objects. You could require um, P to be bijective on objects, so that there is a bijection between the set of objects of Fin and the set of objects of L. But uh, yeah, this is just um, a slicker way to, to say the same thing, up to some isomorphisms that will be the object part of P. I hope this clarifies. So uh, wait a minute. Do you do you mean that so L has the same object as Fin, but so yes. the the morphism, uh, the functor just changes the morphisms? Uh, well, it maps morphisms of Fin, which are functions between finite sets, to morphisms in L. But uh, yeah. there is no there is no request about. Uh, uh, P being full or, or even uh, faithful, but uh, the, the cases in which P is not faithful are very pathological. But okay. the, 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 there is absolutely no request for, um, for P on, on P being full. So there might be, and in fact, the, the, inter the interesting examples are exactly those where P is not full because there, is more, there are more operations than the trivial ones in, in, um, in L. Because you see, since fin is the free category uh, with the um, with coproducts, or fin op is the free category with products over a point, your morphisms will not be more than the strictly necessary ones for the category to be free. So every category with uh, with uh, uh, products will um, will contain a nomomorphic image in a sense of the free category with products over the point. And this is exactly what happens with P. So, um, and apart a couple of pathological examples, you can take P always faithful so that it will be injective on morphisms, but highly yeah. non-full. So that, and the, the, the part which is outside the image of P of the various components of P on morphisms is exactly the one you're interested in. Because uh, yeah, that's that's your that's the non-trivial part of your theory. Okay, thanks. Thanks to you for the question. It's a pleasure to clarify. Okay, uh, another very very elementary remark is that there is a category of these things because um, if you have a unfortunately I don't have a device to write down, but if you have P from Finop to L and Q from, uh, let's say, Finop to L, uh, L prime, a morphism will be a functor from L to L prime that makes the obvious triangle commutative. And this is a very simple, uh, simple definition. Okay, um, now I want to concentrate on these theorem that, in my opinion, is one of the, 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 the deepest and the cleanest way to, um, to uh, show you how deep, how profound, and how, how also um, pervasive this definition is. Because the definition above of Olavier theory admits many equivalent characterizations 
I, I'm not even listing all of them now. So this theorem says that it is equivalent to give a Lovier theory in the sense above, and the definition comes from Lovier's PhD thesis, 1963. Slightly later, Linton proved that a Lovier theory is uniquely determined by a finitary monad T on the category of sets. A monad, I guess all of you know, finitary means that T commutes with a certain class of colimits, the uh, colimits that are indexed over a, a, a finitely filtered category. Again, very late, but uh, this theorem was in the air for quite some time. This 2003 is just the, the moment when the, the, the right set of people met together and wrote down the theorem that was considered uh, a folkloristic result. A Lovier theory is equivalent to a certain kind of category, um, which is finitely presentable, locally finitely presentable, and uh, monadic over the category of sets with a finitary monad. This is slightly, just slightly different from condition two, from the, the category in two. Mostly because you see how to connect two and three. You just take the category of algebras for finitary monad and vice versa, given a, a monadic category, you know that there is a monad that induces that as a category of algebra. Again, this was probably known to Lovier, but I don't think he ever wrote it down. A Lovier theory is exactly equivalent to a certain kind of operad, which is called a Cartesian operad. If you don't know what is an operad, um, that is a very good question. There are many possible approaches. Depending on your on the, the books you, write, you, you read, uh, the, the papers you you meet, but for the purposes of this talk, an operad will be uh, a certain kind of monoid uh, in a monoidal category. This monoidal category is the monoidal category of functors from the category of finite sets to the category of all sets. The monoidal structure is a little bit complicated because it's this diamond operation. It is absolutely different, utterly different from the Cartesian structure that renders this category a Cartesian category. It is called a substitution product because, well, there will be a slide explaining it. Finally, a Lovier theory is exactly equivalent to a certain kind of monad over the category I defined above, functors from fin to set. This monad has to be co-continuous, must preserve all colimits, and it must preserve another monoidal structure, again, which is called convolution monoidal structure. And the substitution monoidal structure will be, can, can be defined through the convolution monoidal structure. But you shouldn't be worried about this complicated web of, of uh, monoidal structures on this, on this category. It's enough that you uh, retain the idea that the category of functors from fin to set is extremely rich in structure. And depending on where you look, you can see different uh, presentations for your, for your algebraic theory. So I want to show you, at least give you an idea of how these connections, these equivalences are approved. Of course, all these equivalences are equivalences of categories because there is a category of it theories, there is a category of unitary monads, et cetera, et cetera. And you can lift uh, correspondences on objects in order for them to become equivalences of categories. So it's the real dream of the category theorist. Okay. First, I want to concentrate on one if and only if two, if and only if three. I already told you more or less how two if and only if three works, but and now I will show you how to go back and forth between theories and monads. This is a slight variation on Linton's original idea. So I want to start with my theory. So let's let P be a fixed theory and L be its codomain. I want to perform this pullback in the category of categories, but don't be scared about the category of categories. It's a very simple construction and it is as strict as it can be because this, there is a very canonical isomorphism filling this square. Uh, I take a leg to be pre-composition with P. 
because I can take categories of functors, pre-shift and co-pre-shift categories, and I can take a functor from L to set and pre-compose it with P in order to obtain something from FinOp to set. And on the other leg, I take a set and I choose a very particular functor sending N to the endfold power of A. So N, A goes to the functor that sends N to A to the N. Very easy. Okay, I do the pullback and this category, M of L, is extremely important because the pullback gives me a functor um, from M of L to set that will behave exactly as a forgetful functor. Every time you have an algebraic theory, you can build a category of models. For example, if your algebraic theory is the theory of groups, you can build a category of models, which will be exactly the category of groups. And in, for this choice of L, you will exactly be the forgetful functor that sends a group to its carrier, the, the set of its elements. Okay, this functor U is extremely uh, rich in properties because, well, there are um, very slick way to, to uh, endow you with uh, very good properties. For example, the, the fact that I'm doing a pullback of uh, uh, finite representable categories will uh, entail that M of L is again locally presentable, finite representable. And I can build by end a uh, left joint for you. So um, I'm left with uh, a forgetful functor that admits a left joint. I am just so this far from having a monad because every adjunction gives me a monad. The, the key step now is to observe that precomposition with P is a monadic functor. And uh, fortunately, I can pull back monadic functors to obtain still monadic functors. So M of L will be exactly the category of algebras for the monad UF. Amazing. So I get a locally presentable and monadic category over set. Finally, since U is finitary, the monad is finitary. This is a very general result. The, the monad UF generated by an adjunction uh, preserves all the colimits that are preserved by the forgetful, the, the right adjoint. So these categories really behave like categories of models because they are exactly uh, monadic categories of a set where the forgetful functor is finitary. And also, again, they are finitary monads. Cool. So now for the other way around. Given a finitary monad, I can consider its Gleisley category, the category of free algebras, and I can restrict the free functor to act only on finite sets. So I can take, for example, finitely generated groups or finitely generated monoids or you, you name it, you choose your favorite um, algebraic theory. This functor, again, by a general property of the category of categories, can be factored as uh, a composition where the first step is bijective on object and with a little trick, uh, you can render it uh, the identity on object. And uh, this functor is followed by a fully faithful functor. So how do I obtain uh, a Lovier theory? I just take this factorization, this functor from set to Gleisley T is the free functor, and this J that here is nameless is just the inclusion of finite in all sets. I factor these as bijective on objects and fully faithful. I always can, there, there is a theorem in, that, in, that says that in categories I can always perform this factorization. This is a, a key, this is actually a, a real factorization system on the category of categories. Um, if you have never met this, think about uh, the possibility to factor every function in set as an epimorphism followed by a monomorphism. Same thing happens, but with different classes of morphism here. So once I did this, I just discard the fully faithful part and I keep the bijective on object part. That will be my theory. Now, there's a theorem of Linton that proved this equivalence that says that what on earth could the category of models, the M of L of the previous step of this P possibly be. They, it will exactly be uh, the category of algebras for the monad I started with. 
So you see, I guess, again, automatically this construction gives me a monadic category because I really obtained the category of algebras for the monad I started, I started with. And uh, you can show, it's quite easy if they tell you the idea, but Linton didn't tell anyone telling him, uh, that these two correspondences are mutually inverse. So we did it. Now for a slightly more difficult implication, every uh, monad on the category of sets, I want to prove, you see on the, on the head of the, of the slide, I want to prove that two is equal to four. And two, if you don't remember the list, two is finitary monads over the category of sets. And four is uh, uh, the, that mysterious category of Cartesian operands. Okay, let's take a monad on the category of sets and uh, let's restrict it to um, fin by precomposing it with J, the inclusion of fin into set. Now, with uh, another categorical construction that is called a can extension along J, I can uh, uh, re recover, I can reconstruct T. Because if I perform this can extension along J of the composition TJ, um, I can recover T if and only if T was a finitary monad. How do you formalize this, this uh, result? Well, precomposition with J defines a functor in this direction that restricts um, a, a functor from set to set to a functor from fin to set. This precomposition with J, uh, blank uh, circ J, admits a left adjoint, and this is exactly the definition of uh, lan J, the left the can extension along J. And uh, this adjunction restricts to an equivalence of categories um, between all functors from fin to set and uh, finitary functors between set and set. Now, this category, set set omega, well, set set without omega is a monoidal category. And monoids in a category of endofunctors, that's the usual mantra about monads, they are exactly uh, monoids inside this monoidal category. The monoidal structure is just composition of functors. So if I restrict to uh, finitary endofunctors, well, the composition of finitary endofunctors is still finitary. So monoids stay there in the, the, the category is closed under, under the monoidal structure. So I can look at finitary monads as exactly the internal monoids in the category of finitary functors. Now, every time I have a structure here, but possibly not here on the right, I can, you see my pointer, right? You see my arrow. Yes, yes. Okay, perfect. Um, every time I have a structure on the left, but possibly not on the right, I can, uh, I can transport it by simply saying, well, how do I do the product here? I just push it here. Now here I know how to do the product and then I pull it back. And what, whatever I, in, I obtain in the end will be exactly what's needed for this adjunction to be monoidal. So this, this is an equivalence of categories. And uh, if I transport the um, monoidal structure with respect to which here monoids are finitary monads, what I get on the right is exactly uh, a monoidal category where monoids will correspond one-to-one, -one, well, category theoretically one-to-one, to, -one, to uh, finitary monads. So, there is, of course, another definition, but I don't want to get uh, entangled into technicalities. Monoids here, when you write down uh, what the monoidal structure means, will exactly correspond to finitary monads. These are also, these are called, uh, I told you, Cartesian operas, but also clones in very old uh, pieces of literature on, on the subject. I think Lovier was aware of this, uh, of this characterization. I'm, I'm not sure because the literature is not exactly gentle with uh, anyone with a philological interest, but uh, if you happen to know something more, let me know. Okay. Now, 
um, I want to show you the equivalence of um, Cartesian operas with uh, um, convolution preserving co continuous monads on FinSet. Now, it is, uh, I, I understand this might be a little bit of a, of a slate of end if you don't know the, the, the precise technicalities. Uh, the, the overall idea is that it's based on a few general facts. In every monoidal category, if you take a monoid and you tensor with it, you get an endofunctor that is a very specific kind of, of monad. So the idea is that uh, uh, here is that if you take a, a, a Cartesian operat, so if you take a monoid here, you obtain uh, um, a monad over the category fin set of this kind, S, that essentially tensors with respect to the substitution product uh, with, with the, the, the monoid you chose. So this is very easy. It's a very general fact about monoidal structures. It is also quite easy to prove that this monad obtained tensoring with a monoid um, with a, a Cartesian operat. I cannot spell substitution monoid. Um, is co-continuous because tensoring with a certain object is a left adjoint functor in this particular situation. And uh, it's also possible to show that it is monoidal with respect to this other monoidal structure called convolution. I'm not giving you definition, I'm just telling you the, the rough idea. The other implication is slightly more interesting, especially because it's based, you can, you can do the computation just formally using Cohen calculus. I don't want to uh, enter the details, but uh, um, again, I just want to give you the, the idea. After this maybe mysterious series of uh, formal manipulations, if you start with a monad S that has the properties I'm interested into, it's convolution preserving and uh, preserves all co-limits. You can exploit both properties for, in order to show that the action over an object A is just tensoring with a specific object, which is uh, S of J. J again is a certain object here. It's the functor that embeds fin into set. And uh, it turns out that S of J is a very special object because S, if it's co-continuous and uh, convolution preserving, it's completely determined by its action on J because S of A is after this chain of computations of co-limits and preserving products and, and, uh, and powers. Uh, S of A is just A substitution S of J. So pretty cool. You just need a little bit of category theory. Okay, so you can go really far with these ideas because uh, uh, the, the, the amount of literature on the subject is uh, impressive. Many people improved these theorems, uh, extended their validity to other settings. Um, I will just scratch the surface of this extremely big uh, part of category theory and of, of algebra, of categorical algebra. One example that I particularly like is this very recent paper that by, by Eugenia Cheng that essentially says, okay, Lovier theories are finitary monads on the category of sets, but we know what uh, uh, distributive laws between monads are so in theory, there should be a notion of a distributive law between Lovier theories. Well, adapting this uh, old result by Rosberg and Wood, Eugenia Chank was able to prove that a distributive law between Lovier theories is exactly the same thing as a certain factorization system, so a very well understood categorical gadget. Um, in the category that is the Lovier theory, the, the L in the definition of Lovier theory, that has a certain uh, uh, property um, of admitting of uh, being insensitive of morphisms that are in the in the in the image of P. 
So now you see again that the functor P being non-full is what gives the definition and yeah, the theory and its non-triviality because uh, there won't be anything outside the image of P homomorphisms where if, uh, if you ask P to be full. Okay, so you can prove this theorem and uh, if you take the finitary monad over a certain Lovell theory and you take another, let's say you have the theory P, unfortunately I told you I don't have any device to write down something, but imagine you have a Lovell theory P, a Lovell theory Q, and TP and TQ the finitary monads associated. A distributive law between uh, the associated finitary monads correspond exactly to a certain way to factor uh, morphisms in uh, the uh, in a certain uh, join of the codomains of P and Q. So a very neat categorical characterization of something that is naturally associated to monads, finitary monads. Okay, so if you like category theory, I do. So if you like category theory, you also like, uh, you will uh, uh, thrive for enriched category theory. You can um, extend, and actually this is something that John Power did in, at the end of the 90s, you can extend the entire framework that I presented so far to uh, the setting of enriched categories. This is not an empty way, an empty uh, task, because many, in, in many situations, uh, your, your categorical gadget, you know, category theory is all about telling you, okay, this is a definition, and you can export it wherever is needed. For example, I, I, I fell in love with category theory when I understood that it could explain why all isomorphism theorems are the same theorem, just in different places. Now, this generalization of power is based on the same idea. You have a definition of algebraic theory that works for sets, finite sets, etc., where your operations are uh, modeled on uh, an arity, which is just a finite set. And now you want to work over another in another universe of categories where your your uh, where the, the the base the ground category is for example abelian groups or the category of categories or the category of simplicial sets or chain complexes or you name it okay so powers definition is more or less the same just transported to uh, the enriched setting because a theory here is just uh, uh, an identity on object uh, enriched functor from the mm, the subcategory of finite representable objects of a locally finite representable uh, category monodal category that i choose as a base of enrichment so exactly the same thing apart because if v is the category of sets then v less than omega will just be finite sets. Now, an algebra for the theory or a model for the theory is uh, a functor from L to the base of enrichment. Again, if V is set, this is just a model. And uh, this defines a, an enriched category of models, everything works, and uh, all the implications that I showed you remain untouched, just changing the base of enrichment. So, Finitary enriched monads, finitary monadic uh, categories enriched uh, uh, over the uh, that are um, enriched the finite representable monads over this category of v functors from v less than omega to v that preserve uh, certain monadic structures and no limits. You you really see that there is nothing specific about the category of sets in uh, in Fantoria, in Lovier's Fantoria semantics. Again, uh, recently. Sorry. Yeah. Sorry, Fosco. Can I interrupt you a second? Uh, in the previous slide, when you were speaking about these V enriched categories, um, is finite dimensional vector spaces an example of this V less than omega? Yes, absolutely. Every, more generally, every category of modules over a ring will be an example. Uh, R linear or K linear categories are very rich setting in which to you can encode this this theory no, but certainly I, it works for finite vector spaces yes 
I was really focusing on the on the fact that you want finitely presentable objects. So for modules over a ring, I need to consider just finitely generated modules, for instance. Uh, yes. Okay. Exactly. Yes. In uh, in um, in vector spaces, everything gets simpler because uh, every vector space is projective. So. Okay. Thanks. Thanks to you. Okay. So. Again, there are other um, equivalent characterizations. I don't know if I'm um, I'm pushing too hard in this uh, uh, analysis of the of recent literature. I can I can go faster and uh, uh, get to the point faster, or go at this pace. You tell me. I'm profiting from the fact that uh, I guess it was Paolo that stopped me. You tell me. <laughs> Are you okay with the overall pace and the overall way of presenting the material? Are you, uh, did I lose you at slide three? <laughs> if you're speaking directly to me, the answer is no. <laughs> I mean, I'm coming okay. from the same field as you, so <laughs> okay. I'm pretty comfortable with this. Okay, so um, I'm just collecting, maybe it's a little bit of cherry picking, but I'm, I wanted to collect a few very uh, intriguing results that show you how far this point of view can be pushed and how rich and expressive. Uh, if you, if you like, f this is probably not for you, it's for the people who are convinced that, uh, who are not convinced that this Lovier's approach was elegant and uh, there was a bit of genius in his, in his, uh, in his formalization, but uh, you see, it's, his ideas generated a lot of research and most of these ideas are very recent. Anyway, sorry, sorry for the detour. Uh, you can also offer these, um, another equivalent characterization of, of uh, Lovier theories, which is based on uh, categories enriched over the above monoidal category of finitary and of factors of set. Why? Because there is a paper by, by Garner, uh, by Richard Garner, that essentially shows that um, um, a Lovier theory is exactly a category enriched in W, this monoidal category of finitary and of functors, that uh, is also Cauchy complete. So the operation of Cauchy completion is exactly the operation that I fleshed out above that takes uh, um, uh, a monad, namely a v W category with a single object, because monoids in W are finitary monads, but monoids in W are exactly W categories with a single object, extremely elegant. If I take the monad, I regard it as a W category, and uh, I, I split all idempotents, voila, I get a theory. Absolutely brilliant. So, What's the, the, the take home of this, uh, of this result that uh, uh, the operation of taking a monad and uh, breaking it down to obtain a theory from the category theorist's point of view is nothing new. It's just the good old Cauchy completion operation. So in this perspective, there is absolutely no difference between a Lovier theory and the monad that it generates up to Cauchy completion. Amazing. Okay, this was a slide from another talk that I want to recycle, but uh, the Cauchy completion of a monoid is rarely a monoid, of course, because if you take the generic idempotent, the, 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 the free monoid with an idempotent, and you Cauchy complete it, your category is not a single object anymore. Anyway, this is just chit-chatting, I can, I can skip it. Instead, uh, I can concentrate on yet another um, approach to this uh, theory monad correspondence. This comes from a, a, a paper, a very recent paper by John Burke and again Richard Gardner, where essentially they say, okay, let's forget about everything, let's just remove every uh, non-fundamental piece of definition. A pre-theory is uh, this already well-known identity object functor from a certain category that has no property whatsoever. First, it was before it was a finite representable object. Now it's just anything. From here, I can define a monad 
on V with a certain, another kind of can extension. I don't want to enter the details, but there is a way to build, to cook up a monad out of J. And given a monad, uh, I can consider the, its uh, restriction to A, its precomposition with, uh, with uh, J, and uh, then I can factor and just take the bijective on object, the identity on object part. So this sets up an adjunction between theories that actually are called pre-theories and monads. Now, every adjunction between categories induces an equivalence of categories but, uh, between the, the, the fixed points of the co-monad of the adjunction and the fixed point of the monad of, well, oh, oops. Yeah, sorry. There is an equivalence between the fixed point of the monad, GF, and the co-monad, FG, of the adjunction, FG, F left adjoint to G. So, and by construction, when you find this adjunction, this is the biggest it can be. So, by construction, you cannot refine this theorem. It's as general as it can possibly be. You can debate that this notion of theory is too general, and I sort of agree. But by construction, by, by it's, this result is engineered to be impossible to generalize further, because this equivalence is the biggest that F and G can, can induce. So their main theorem is there is a class of theories, fixed points of, on one side, and a class of monads, fixed points on the other side, that correspond uh, with an equivalence of categories. Again, extremely elegant. Okay, I don't want to go on forever. There are others, uh, other approaches that I completely disregarded, not because they are not interesting, but because they are, uh, again, they would deserve many slides more. Um, you can keep these slides, uh, you can, I can send them to you and you can Google for these other references. The list is endless. Anyone who wants to write down a proper uh, chronology of the research in, the, in this uh, very enticing field of category theory is doomed to fail. Um, just out of, uh, of uh, just as a little break, uh, men, mm, uh, way to, to ease you that are listening this super difficult theorems in category theory. I wanted to try at least try to uh, draw a, a chronological order for all the papers that I met when I was studying this stuff. You see, you can sort of divide in two parts the, the, the research on the subject. Everything starts with Lovier's PhD thesis that changed everything and mostly invented a big chunk of category theory. Then there are the, the theorems of Linton. Then uh, Charles uh, Erzman and Gabriel and Ulmer uh, approached the, the, the idea of defining theories in a more general setting. And uh, they wanted to study more general situations than uh, operations between of, of certain arities between sets. And they came up with the definition of sketch. Um, Linton later generalized uh, Lovier's approach to having not only an arbitrarily big set of, uh, of um, arities for the operations, but a whole category of arities. And this matches with Power's um, approach, because if you enrich theories over the category of categories, then what you get is uh, precisely Linton's definition. Exploiting the work of Erzman, Gabriel, and Ulmer, uh, Ulmer and Gabriel and many other people defined uh, what now we now call uh, presentable categories, finitely or lambda presentable categories. Curiously enough, the the description of uh, one of the descriptions uh, that I gave was first offered uh, by um, um, Peter Johnston and Gavin Wright, if I remember well. Um, in order to describe uh, theories internal to uh, an elementary topos or a topos that is a fiber category over a base topos. So you see categorical logic really is um, in depth with uh, all this stream of research. Then there is this huge gap and uh, we come to the 90s where there was this revival of, uh, of research in, uh, in um, um, 
in, on this topic. If you ask me, I, I, I don't know, but if you ask me if I had to, to tell you why, I think because just recently we learned uh, enriched category theory better. So Power was the first to um, state the definition of enriched theory, even though enriched categories were invented in the 60s, but they were understood way later, if you ask me. So, and this is uh, distributive laws between monads, the paper by Gardner as uh, f, uh, f is the category W above, and then um, you name it. It's just, uh, now it's impossible to track down everything. Okay, so this is the end of, the, of this super fast crash course on algebraic theories and factorial semantics. Now, what, are, what do we want to talk about today? Uh, do I still have, I can, I can postpone this part to later if you want, if I am half way through. Well, we're uh, kind of half, we, we did when we were 50 minutes. Okay, so, so maybe I can stop okay. for five minutes and we can restart. Okay. I will try to unshare, not on, because I want to see. Mm. <laughs> okay. Okay, okay, I'm ready when you are. Uh, we can start. Okay, so um, I was saying, what's this talk about finally? Well, this talk is about essentially algebraic theories, where, as I told you at the beginning, operations are um, can be partially defined. Okay, let's traverse the desert of this ugly definition of an essential algebraic theory. You have to fix an equational theory, um, and you have to specify a subset of totally defined operations and uh, a function defined on the complement of the uh, totally defined operation symbols that uh, accounts for the domain of definition of the operations that are not total. A model is uh, something that assigns a carrier and uh, uh, operations and a domain of definition. Every totally defined operation will have a totally defined function and uh, every non-total uh, operation symbol will be associated to a non-totally defined uh, function operation defined over the carrier. So this is the definition coming from uh, Adamek and Ozyshki locally presentable categories. You see it's full of, Eilenberger wouldn't have liked it, to say the least. And uh, more or less the aim of this part of the talk is to show you how you can probably fix this in Eilenberg's sense. Okay, cool. So uh, why first this theorem appears in a book about locally presentable categories, in a book about categorical logic? Well because there is a very tight connection between uh, uh, essential algebraic theories, locally finitely presentable categories, and categories with finite limits. And this tight connection is called, uh, is a theorem, it's a theorem by Gabriel and Ulmer, it's called Gabriel-Ulmer duality. This theorem asserts an equivalence of, ca of two categories between uh, the two category of small categories with finite limits, functors that preserve said finite limits and natural transformations, and the category on the right side of the two category of locally finitely presentable categories, functors that are right adjoints and preserve omega filtered colimits, directed colimits, and all natural transformation between these functors. Very elegant, very telling. It's a very useful and powerful theorem that Gabriel and Ulmer were able to prove. The connection between um, essential algebraic theories and uh, Gabriel Ulmer duality is uh, uh, goes as follows. Uh, is called what we in, in many category theorists uh, love to call a syntax semantics duality. So every essential algebraic theory can be associated with a finite limit theory, a category with finite limits. And uh, I can exploit Gabriel Ruben duality to build a category of models, which will be a locally presentable category, finitely presentable. 
Conversely, from every locally finite representable category, I can extract a category with finite limits, which is more or less the, it's the, the just the opposite of the subcategory of locally finite of finite representable objects. And this is going to be an essential. Uh, a, it's going to define a, an essential, essential algebra theory. So very cool. Why is it called syntax semantics duality? This is just one example of a syntax semantic duality. The shape of these um, theorems, this class of theorems, goes roughly as follows. You have a category of small things. The, they prescribe the syntax. Um, and uh, these categories are defined by having, in terms of a certain sketch of shapes, of categorical shapes, for example, finite limits, uh, categories with finite limits are categories that admit limits of a certain shape, products and equalizers, or pullbacks and a terminal object, uh, you name it, there are many equivalent characterizations. On the other side, you have syntax, you also want semantics. What is semantics? It's a class of large categories that in a certain sense are the category of models for the categories in the syntax. So very often in category theory, in categorical logic, but also in categorical algebra or in other places, you can build an adjunction between syntax and semantics, between these two classes of categories. And uh, again, very often this adjunction induces a very interesting equivalence of categories. And Gabriel Lumet duality is exactly an instance of this phenomenon. Okay, so now what do we wonder? Is there an analog for the description above? At least some, I will just provide you with a single one because that's the, 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 the core of the paper and the, the, original, the original aim was to provide an equivalent for all of them, but this is a difficult problem. So we uh, concentrated on just one and it's a pretty neat result if you ask me already. Um, so we were looking for a sort of a Lovier style approach to um, essential algebraic theories. Each of us motivated by different, uh, a different uh, quest, a different uh, original question, different uh, approaches, different uh, interests, you name it. In a sense, uh, finite limit theories are already there to provide you this categorical approach to um, essential algebraic theories because in this theorem, in this equivalence, every essential algebraic theory defines a finite limit theory, and so you get it. But uh, the problem is that this is not really Lovier style. And uh, quoting from the paper, we have a doctrine of finitely complete categories, but this does not provide a, a, a real notion of syntax to replace uh, the terms you want to work with if you want to uh, operate with uh, partially defined uh, functions and operations. So the answer is we can fix this problem and really provide uh, uh, an analog for a Lovier style approach to essential algebraic theories while uh, rediscovering the equivalence between uh, uh, essential algebraic theories and locally finitely presentable categories that exploits um, Gabriel Lumet duality. Okay, so this was the end of part one, but probably I got I went uh, a little bit long. I want to start part two with uh, a short slide showing you how not to prove the theorem. Mostly, I'm mostly I'm sentimentally attached to, to this approach still, even if it doesn't work. But I want to show you that it doesn't work and suggest you why. So our, even and I started uh, working on this paper and then uh, Pavel and Chad uh, followed, our original idea was to exploit uh, the enriched uh, approach of power to Lovier theories that I described uh, before, starting from the idea that uh, now your, if your semantics before, if your models were valued in the category of sets, now you want them to be valued in the category of partial sets, sets and partial functions. So this category par will be 
the category having object sets and partial functions as morphisms. It turns out that this category of partial sets is equivalent to another very well-known category in the category of pointed sets and functions that preserve the base point. So, idea, let's take the enriched category approach, uh, uh, the, the enriched approach of power, and let's just do the same thing for categories enriched over par or pointed sets. Turns out it doesn't work. One problem is that you cannot recycle uh, the machinery that makes Linton theorem work. In insight, if you ask me, after all this time, I think the deep reason why that approach didn't work is that we were working in the wrong two categories. So the uh, enriched approach of power uh, wasn't enough to capture some new phenomena that arise when you allow your uh, operations to be partially defined. Fortunately, Chad and Pavel came to the rescue and uh, told us that there was a, there is a setting, especially Chad came to the rescue in his respect. Uh, it took some time for us to be convinced that that was a viable path. Mm, but it works in the end, so kudos to Chad. Um, there is a setting where you can do this thing, paying a price. You just have to move to a different uh, categorical word. Okay, so now for the approach that in the end worked. Uh, it's based on a categorical gadget that is called a restriction category. I really don't want to enter the technicalities of what is a restriction category. It's just a category that is endowed with a certain additional structure that is called restriction structure. And um, how, how can you visualize this? Well, category theorists like to take a well-known and concrete concept and say, for example, that an abelian category is just a category that, that behaves like abelian groups. So it satisfies axioms that, uh, to the effect that the category will be just a slightly modified model of abelian groups. Same is true with toposes. They are generalized categories of sets. And the set theory you, you can do in set, probably this is not the most politically correct thing to say to this audience, but <laughs> the set theory you can do in set is uh, uh, just a particular instance of a generalized set theory that you can do into an elementary topos or a Grothendieck topos. What is a restriction structure in this philosophy? Well, it's a category that behaves like the category of um, sets and partial functions. In this category, you specify a suitably coherent choice of a certain idempotent morphism attached to every morphism f, the idempotent will be f bar. And these f bars satisfy a certain complicated, a lot of axioms that, uh, uh, to the effect that in the end, your category will behave like a generalized model of uh, sets and partial functions. You can speak about restricting an abstract morphism of a category C whenever C is endowed with a restriction structure. Of course, as always, if these gadgets wouldn't form a two category, we would throw them away. There is a two category of restriction categories. There is a notion of functor that preserves this, this uh, restriction structure. And there is a notion of natural transformation that is compatible with the structure. So these two categories are a whole new word. If you ask me, is a pretty ugly one because for the, for the average category theorist, these gadgets are just Feel, feel like a hack. But uh, oh, there is a mistake here. It's Cockett with 2T. There is a whole lot, a whole series of paper by Robin Cockett and Steve Lack that uh, build the foundation of these restriction categories, studying many, 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 many categorical constructions. For example, limits, co-limits. Uh, there are papers about uh, the notion of pre-sheaf, what is a restriction pre-sheaf, uh, what is the unit embedding, uh, and you name it, and so on and so on. But um, it turns out for the average category theorist, these things are a little bit of a hack. Again, a hack that works, but uh, you know, you don't really want to enter the technicality. Okay, as of today, it's 
although the only way we have to provide this Lovier style definition for essentially algebraic theories and to prove the equivalence between uh, algebraic theories and uh, uh, locally finite representable category. So, okay, so fortunately, the kind of restriction categories and restriction functors we want to exploit to define uh, partial Lovier theories is slightly better behaved. Uh, so, what is more or less the idea of this uh, of this approach. Um, a partial Lovier theory will be the analog in the restriction world of uh, a Lovier theory, an identity, an object, functor, which instead of being Cartesian will preserve the analog of products in the restriction world. Every partial Lovier theory will have a category of models, of partial models, which is not modeled over the category of sets, but over the category of sets and partial functions, over par. And these, hopefully, will be the, the gist of the, of the equivalence theorem, of the variety theorem. Okay, the kind of structure we want to study, the kind of category and functors we want to study, fortunately, is a little bit more intuitive, a little more responsive to intuition. So the kind of restriction categories we are interested into is, turns out, is just a, a specific kind of monoidal category. So you can completely erase every occurrence of restriction category and restriction functor from the rest of the talk, and I will do the same, because uh, the kind of categories we are interested into are just uh, those symmetric monoidal categories where you can equip every object with a structure of a what is called a partial Fabinius algebra and uh, some coherence conditions on top. I don't want to enter the definition for the purposes of and for the approach I want to take to this uh, to this talk. This is enough. The paper, of course, is pretty clear in uh, stating everything. Um, and uh, yeah. I guess we can start with the actual definition. Okay, what is a partial Lovier theory? Uh, DCR means it's just a acronym for discrete Cartesian restriction, this special kind of monoidal categories. So a partial Lovier theory is just a certain kind of identity and object functor. A DCR functor is a functor that preserves the monoidal structure before, no surprise, which is defined from the category of partial functions, uh, partial co-functions. You, you take, you take uh, um, the opposite of fin, and then you take uh, uh, morphisms in the opposite of fin, which are partially defined. It turns out that this is just uh, um, you, you can you can work out this definition and see that this is just a, a suitable category of cospans where one leg is a surjective function, but it's not really important for the purpose of the definition. So this functor, uh, this uh, the, uh, a functor of this kind from partial op to L is a partial Lovier theory if it's uh, this here functor preserves the monoidal structures, and it's the identity on objects. No surprise. A morphism of Lovier theories is just a functor between the codomains of P and Q that makes the obvious triangle commute. So there is a category of partial Lovier theories. A model of partial Lovier theories of a, fi of a fixed uh, partial Lovier theory will be just a functor preserving the uh, fixed, uh, the, the above monoidal structure from L, the co-domain of the theory to the category of sets and partial functions. No surprise. The only little surprise is in the definition of homomorphism, because for technical reasons, you have to require the natural transformations to be lax. There is a notion of two cell in, uh, in uh, restriction categories that uh, is more or less defined as a pre-order and uh, the naturality squares for these alphas will commute up to a certain inequality. Again, this is not really 
the, the, the main focus. Okay, so how do you prove the theorem now that you have all the pieces in place? Well, you just need uh, an additional little result. Little, well, it's the key result. If I start with a category of fi with finite limits, then I can build uh, a, a restriction category, which is the category of partially defined morphisms in C. They are spans where one leg is a monomorphism and the monomorphism accounts for the domain of definition. It turns out to be a, discrete, a, disc, a DCR category, a discrete Cartesian restriction category. And conversely, every restriction category uh, possesses a subcategory of total maps where the, in the case of par C, where when the leg, the monomorphic leg is also an isomorphism, then that map is total. So if you extract uh, the, the subcategory of total maps from a restriction category, then uh, if the category is Cauchy complete, then will this dot C will have finite limits. Turns out that this sets up an adjunction, and in fact a reflective a reflection between uh, the category of the CRCs, discrete Cartesian restriction categories, and the category of categories with finite limits. Okay, so the theorem is the following. There is a two adjunction between, uh, uh, oh, this, there is a mistake here. Uh, this, um, oh, no, wait. No, no, there is no mistake. Okay, there is an adjunction between uh, uh, a contravariant adjunction between uh, uh, the CRC less or equal. This means the requirement uh, over uh, a requirement over natural transformations over two cells. They are lax. Naturality squares commute up to inequality, and uh, locally finite representable categories. LFP is the same category as in gabriel lubman duality. The CRC is uh, the CR categories. Cartesian restriction functors and uh, lux transformations. Okay, the unit of this adjunction is an equivalence, and this means that every LFP category is exactly equivalent to the category of models of uh, the theory I can extract from it. Okay, what is the uh, the key point now? Um, we want to define an adjunction that uh, uh, links together categories with finite limits and the CRC less or equal in order to formalize uh, this slide. Okay, KT is uh, more or less w working uh, as a Cauchy completion because uh, given a DCRC, I can define a category that has objects, pairs, an object, and idempotent. Arrows preserve the, the fixed idempotent. There is a straightforwardly defined uh, category structure, and one can, and also the identity choice is immediate, one can painstakingly prove that KT of X has uh, finite limits just by exhibiting uh, uh, witnesses for products and equalizers. And uh, on the other side, there is a functor par that takes uh, um, a category with finite limits and uh, it sends it to its category of partial maps, spans of morphisms in the category where a leg is ammonic. Okay, this turns out to be always Cauchy complete for formal reasons. So these two functors arrange in an adjunction and the co-unit is an isomorphism. This essentially means that there is a reflection. Lex is too reflective into the CRCs, and the CRCs are exactly, um, yeah, finite limits get, uh, categories with finite limits are exactly um, Cauchy complete, the CRCs. And to cut it a little bit short, but this, is the, this doesn't uh, leave anything out of the main idea, Joining together this theorem and gabriel lume duality, this, the, the above theorem is one and uh, gabriel lume duality is two, one gets exactly the theorem above, the theorem uh, here. You get a reflection that essentially exhibits every 
LFP as the category of models of its underlying theory. Neat. So now for the examples, I don't want to enter the examples in fair detail. I just want to give, give a bird's eye view of the examples with screenshots from the paper. And I want to convince you that there are many examples and also some examples are outside of the classical uh, Lovier approach to functorial semantics, not only because the operations are partially defined, but also because there are in equations in the uh, in the the, equi the the equational theory that defines my essential algebraic theory. Okay, so partial structures, sets with operations that has a partial um, domain of a known total domain of definition, can also can uh, obviously be captured by by this framework. One example is uh, that of commutative monoids, but you can remove commutative, you can take groups, you can take uh, semi-groups, you can take magmas, whatever classical algebraic structure you find in Bourbaki, you just remove the totality requirement and, uh, and that's it. We can capture equivalence relations. As you can see, uh, the paper exploits quite a lot uh, formalism based on string diagrams. I, I like string diagrams, uh, but I'm still in the process of uh, uh, translating the category theory I learned with uh, uh, in, in this other language. So I won't rely on it, but this is not at all a, a, a political choice. Um, as you can see, I, we can, we can uh, uh, capture equivalence, equivalence relations because there will be there, there is a partial of it theory associated to uh, equivalence equivalence relations on sets, and uh, we can describe uh, diagrammatically the requirements for the relation to be symmetric, reflexive, and uh, transitive. Uh, you you see very soon that the definition of model really requires that uh, uh, your your morphism of models are um, there are inequalities in the definition of uh, morphism of models just because uh, I'm more familiar with the example for categories but uh, well maybe I can come back to this later uh, when I okay another example is the one with categories where uh, there is a partial of it theory whose models are exactly categories the category of categories and uh, here, model morphisms, you want them to be functors, of course. But uh, uh, the definition of morphism of models here really involves an inequality, which in general is not an equality. Because the inequality request essentially means that uh, if uh, uh, the, the, the image of the composition of two morphisms in the category um, under a functor, is just the composition of the images if the first composition was defined, requiring uh, this inequality to be an inequality means that if f composed with g is defined, then f maps this composition into the composition of ff and fg. So the composition of ff and fg is also defined. But uh, the converse inequality will uh, entail that if f of f can be composed with f, and g, uh, with f of g, then f and g could be composed. This is, of course, false. In, uh, in You can build a very, very small, finite examples where there are categories and a functor between them where this fails. So for relations, equivalence relations, the same thing happens, more or less. So you see, there is really the need to have uh, lax transformations and not, uh, not strict ones. Okay, of course, before categories, there are graphs. You can also capture the theory of directed graphs and reflexive graphs, and uh, these will provide, of course, with, with the expected definition of model and model morphism, just a map of graphs and a map of, of reflexive, reflexive graphs. Okay, yeah, this is what I told you in words. You can 
also um, narrow your attention to specific classes of categories. For example, you can capture Cartesian categories, categories with products, or Cartesian closed categories. The diagrammatic translation for what is a theory, having as models Cartesian closed categories, is uh, new, but the idea is old. It dates back to a very old paper by Peter Freud. But, and, um, but there, the presentation is completely equational. And if you ask me, again, clever, extremely clever, as always, when Peter Fried writes mathematics, but uh, quite heavy-ended, uh, quite cumbersome and difficult to follow, this presentation instead just requires visual, visual intuition. So it's, uh, again, my opinion, but I may be biased because I, am, I worked in this paper, but it's more elegant and uh, you just uh, need to follow graphical calculus. Okay, so I guess this ends the, the roundup of examples. I, I think I can end my talk with a very quick discussion on what's, what is there to do, what are the prospects from, from now on, what do we want to do, what I, especially I want to do with this piece of work. Um, of course, there are more things on the table. Uh, um, these are just my, my, my aesthetics, my, my, my personal taste guided the choice of what's there to do now. But anyway, every, every, every comment is more than welcome. Every new idea is more than welcome. Um, if you ask me, I am particularly interested in uh, finding a monad theory correspondence. Because if you remember, uh, we uh, the the the, the equivalent characterizations for uh, an algebraic theory that I gave you at the beginning, um, one of them was uh, Alovir theory is exactly a locally finitely presentable category uh, monadic over set with affinitary monad. In this setting, what completely breaks down the equivalence is the fact that. Uh, one cannot expect the category of models of a partial logic theory to be monadic. You just get some um, locally finite representable categories in that way, because not every, every, not every uh, LFP category is a monadic over set. There are very blatt and counterexamples, both sets, categories, and also others. So I would really love to see in which sense, or to have a counterexample, that in this setting, algebraic theories, even partial algebraic theories, are monoids of some kind. And I tried as hard as I could to find this monad theory correspondence, but I couldn't. This doesn't mean it's, uh, doesn't mean it's false, it just means I'm not uh, good enough to find it. I tried everything I had in mind, I even tried to study the two category theory of restriction categories because uh, monads are a, a spell you can cast in every two categories. So a fortiori in the two category of restriction categories. But you see, one really doesn't want to, resol doesn't want to resort to such a complicated uh, and uh, super abstract framework without having uh, done the, the concrete math before. So this approach didn't lead to anything particularly interesting so far. I tried to, uh, I had a conversation with, uh, with Robin Cockett, one of the authors, one of the inventors of uh, restriction categories about uh, um, a restriction analog for Cartesian operats. And uh, it turned out that one of the students where he is based, now I don't remember where he is based in Canada, but uh, it turned out that one of his students worked out uh, a definition of opera in that setting. And again, I tried to make it work, but I couldn't, maybe because I still don't understand something. I am exploring uh, bi categories, double categories, whatever, whatever works. I'm extremely open, but for the moment, any flavor of each flavor of two category theory where I tried to cast a monad theory correspondence failed. So in my opinion, this is a very enticing problem, especially because 
I suspect at this point that the solution is non-trivial. So if at some point uh, I find the answer, or, or maybe I just fail to see it, but if you have the answer, this is something I really care, if you, or if you want to study with me, this is even, even better. <laughs> this is something I really want to shed a light on. Another very interesting question is uh, the following. The category of ill theories can be equipped with a monoid structure that essentially says, I have two theories and I can tensor them uh, to the effect that uh, the models of the tensor of theories are just the models of the first valued in the second or vice versa, because this operation is commutative. So for example, you can take the category of uh, uh, commutative monoids and the category of uh, monoids you mix them together, and what you get is uh, the category of uh, commutative rings, let's say. So this is a result, uh, a monoid structure that is fairly well understood uh, conceptually, because there are very profound uh, reasons why this exists and why it's a canonical choice of a monoid structure. I have the feeling uh, very few concrete examples have been worked out uh, and uh, very few concrete description of this has been, has been, has been offered, but uh, again, I might have missed uh, some relevant piece of literature. Anyway, the idea is to do the same thing for partial theories. So finding an analog of this monoid structure should be easy. We honestly, none of us, I, I didn't try to sit down and do the math. I don't remember anyone else in the in the author list tried, but this is definitely an interesting question. So again, ideas, suggestions, uh, you met something that resembles uh, this possible definition, it rings a bell, uh, feel free to, to tell me, tell us, and uh, let's do the math together. <laughs> okay, so this is the end of the talk. I left uh, free space for discussion, but then I forgot uh, to take my, my, my pen to scribble. So I guess we can just chat if you have questions or if you need, uh, if you want me to repeat something, if you lost something. Okay, let me unshare the screen and I'm back and I see you. Okay. Are there any questions? Uh, a very naive one. Among the various partial structure you could reach with your theory, uh, they look to me all homogeneous structures. So, for example, partial commutative monoids, you have a multiplication of uh, a multiplication which is partial, or categories in which the composition is partial. But can you also, for example, reach partial actions of groups on sets? Huh. As they have been introduced by Excel, Dokuchayev, Abadi, and all the people working in partial actions? Uh, well, I, I don't know the precise definition. I can try to read it uh, between the lines. Is it just a, a group action where the action is a partial map? Yes. Okay, just that. Well, Gut feeling, uh, yes, you can make it work. I, I would, I cannot tell you from the top of my head what is the the, the theory, the Lovir theory associated to total group actions. I should, I would have to sit and write it down. Okay. Uh, I mean, this doesn't mean it's impossible. I just don't know the answer from the top of my head. I think if you can do this for total group actions, then uh, I'm pretty confident you can do it for partial group actions. You might have to divide, or, or maybe not, you might have to divide the case where the every element of the group acts on uh, some elements of the set or vice versa. Some group elements act or everywhere might be i i don't know i'm not sure because uh uh yeah i see the point uh-huh but the, in general for 
partial actions of groups, all the elements of the group act on some elements of your set. Okay, so you want the category theorist answer? That partial action is just a functor from the group to the category of sets and partial functions. Because a group action is just a pre sheaf on the group. Fix a group G, what is a functor from G to the category of sets? Just a set over, over which the group acts. Mm -hmm. Now, instead of sets, take uh, par, par, sets mm -hmm. and partial functions, mm -hmm. and that's your partial theory. So yes, I guess the answer is yes in the end. For a very, I don't want to say trivial, but I guess the reason is evident. Now, your your uh, in a sense, your theory is just the group, and uh, models are functors out of that group. Of course, you have to keep the group fixed in this approach. If you want it to vary, uh, you get something fibered over groups. Uh, it's not impossible to work it out, but uh, I wouldn't go that way. Okay. And if instead I would like to have also elements of the group that do not act on anything, then in this case, I cannot replicate the same construction. No. But you can say that uh, the partial group, mm -hmm. uh, something that works like a group, but where the group operation is not uh, all everywhere defined, that's a restriction category. No, wait, no, no, that's false, blatantly false. Wait, let me think. The group operation is not total. Uh, the, what I wanted to say, that is a restriction pre sheaf Maybe. I have to think about these, these mm -hmm. other cases. You see why you see why the gut feeling was maybe you have to divide uh, the case where the group is totally acting, but not every element acts or vice versa, because there is this asymmetry between mm -hmm. uh, the two. One of them is as a very elegant reformulation. You mm -hmm. just change set with par. But the other, I'm, I'm, I don't know. Maybe, maybe it's easy. I just have to think about it. But then I have a silly question. Uh, in par, can I have an end of function whose domain is the empty subset? Definitely, yes. So in principle, I can encode the fact that not every element of the group act on any element of the set by saying that the corresponding function has the empty domain. Oh. Mm, yes. It's not silly. The, I, it seems to be clever. <laughs> 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 I don't know. I on, Honestly, I don't know. I, I, have to, I have to think about it. But thank you. This is a, an interesting example to work out. Oh, you're welcome. I'm working on that also. So <laughs> that's why I knew. <laughs> Actually, I'm mainly attending this talk because I was curious to see your approach to partial actions. <laughs> okay. Well, we can definitely discuss it uh, together. I I probably put you on the on the wrong track uh, already, but. <laughs> <laughs> That's if interesting. I, none, of us, I, none of us thought about this. If I can, I also have another question then. Um, if you have a partial theory, can you extract a kind of global theory or can you construct a kind of global theory that by restriction gives your partial? You can. This is not really worked out in complete detail on the, the paper you find on archive, but we are tweaking a little bit... Uh, the exposition here and there while adding a few things we discovered uh, meanwhile. And uh, if I remember well, this is something we discussed definitely. Uh, the, the way in which you can um, define, uh, you can extract uh, the, the total, the subcategory of total, a, a sub theory that accounts for the totally defined operations. Okay. So, if you do this, you get an adjunction between uh, partial over theories and classical over theories. 
and well the, the fact that this Sanajan is conjectural at the moment but uh, yes this is uh, something we are in the process of working out I don't remember if the adjoint provided it exists is left or right uh, this will uh, give you the maximally total or the minimally total choice uh, you know the, the usual yoga of this kind of constructions but definitely the in my opinion this correspondence is not really enlightening uh, illuminating at the level of uh, theories but on the level of uh, at the level of models yes because uh, uh, every again i'm just rebuilding with my memory uh, the, the this piece of mathematics so i might be wrong but if i remember well every locally uh, the, the problem with the mo monad theory correspondence was that uh, if you insist on having monadic categories you just capture those um, those categories that are regular and uh, finitely presentable cat is not regular Pos, poset is not regular so you really rule out two of the main examples uh, sorry what do you mean by regular um it's a it's a stability it's a condition that is stated in terms of um uh, epimorphisms don't don't ask me please it's a categorical <laughs> notion uh, i i read it i read it 20 times and i always forget it <laughs> okay it's a list fine. of axioms it's a list of axioms on the category uh, regular epimorphisms are stable under pullback uh, and you have finite limits, something like that. So not really illuminating, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> but you only get those because okay. monadic categories over set must be regular because set is regular. Again, categorical yoga, categorical lingo. Every LFP has a regular core. Mm -hmm. So a maximal regular category inside it. Mm -hmm. um, and what you get when you take the model of the total sub theory is exactly the regular core again this okay. is not a theorem we didn't prove it it's con uh, just a conjecture at the moment okay but this is the most uh, precise way i can answer it but you still thought about extracting a sub theory so extracting something which is the biggest that satisfy the property yes because the other approach uh, is not really meaningful. Uh, there are, if you want to um, maximally complete all uh, um, all uh, functions, all operations where they are not defined, there is no canonical way to do it. Where do new where do you send the elements out of the domains in a canonical way? Um, because uh, categorically speaking, I don't know how to answer, but uh, set theoretically speaking, when you have a partial action of a group on a set, you take the big set taking the cross product, you take simply the Cartesian product of the group and the set, and then you mm -hmm. quotient by some relations that converts, that uh, forces the regular action of the group on itself to collapse on the partial action of the group on the set when you can and when you can't you leave it mm. where it is mm. this is really similar not but maybe not but uh, it reminds me of a construction that even and i found uh, while we were trying to flesh out this uh, a certain left adjoint uh, for partial theories let's let's discuss it uh when i am in my <laughs> when i'm less tired then uh, i'm able to speak again so but that's very interesting i really want to go further thank you you're very welcome see serendipity two people don't know they are working on the same problems <laughs> You doubled for some reason. No. I am. A... Oh, sorry. No, no, sorry. My bad. I still have the micro. I have another question. For for the theory theories, you have a notion of free model, and there is something like that uh, even for partial uh, Lovier theories. Uh, yes, the, there is a free functor in this setting uh, mm. as well. Oh, I I left it out of the discussion, but uh, it's in the paper. 
So, so I, if you want me to sketch you the definition, uh, that's I honestly don't remember how to condense it in a few words, but there is a free functor, yes. So from a partial Lovir theory, you can get a, a monad on par. But uh, uh, yes. if I have understood the, correctly the problem of the monad theory, theory's correspondence, the category of models is not the category of algebras. For exactly. that monad. Exactly. Okay. If it was if it was the category of models would be regular and it can't be. So thanks. Okay. Are there other questions? No. So let's thank the speaker again with fake applause. Or maybe also Ooh. with the real applause. <laughs> And that's it. So thank you very thank much. You. I hope you enjoy it. Uh, so we will meet again uh, next week, same hour, same place. Uh, there is going to be Silvia Barbina with a makeup talk that we, we had to skip uh, last time for technical reasons. And hopefully next week uh, she will be here talking with us some more in model theory, the theory of the universal homogeneous standard triple system. Okay. Okay. Thank you all. Goodbye. Thanks to you. Uh, I just close the window and leave. Uh, yes. Yeah.